Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar this afternoon. Uh, my name is Karen Campbell, and I'm a program manager here with the Canadian Women's Foundation. And I'm very happy to welcome you all today uh, to this conversation about sex discrimination in Canada's Indian Act. Um, but before we get started, before I introduce uh, our presenters, I'd like to just cover a couple of housekeeping items with you. Um, so first of all, on the right-hand side uh, of your screen, you can see the GoToWebinar panel, um, and there you will find a box where you can type questions. Um, please uh, feel free to use this box if there's anything that you'd like to ask the presenters, or if you're having any difficulties with the technology. Um, throughout the webinar, I'm going to be uh, online and collecting your questions, and I'll pose those to the speakers um, at the end of the session if there's time, and if not, we'll make sure that, the, that your questions are forwarded along to the presenters, and we'll try to get them answered for you. Um, secondly, in that same panel on the right hand side you'll see a section called handouts if you drop that section down um, you'll be able to see two links um, with PDF uh, documents for you to download um, one is a handout with some resources related to the subject that we're discussing today and another one is um, the PDF copy of the presentation slides for this afternoon so you can go ahead and download those uh, for your reference later on uh, if you wish the third thing is that you should note that this session is being recorded and we will be sharing the recording with all participants um, and everybody who's on our, our registration list after the webinar is over. So today we are going to hear from leading Indigenous and allied feminist advocates in Canada about sex discrimination in the Indian Act uh, related to unknown and unstated paternity and legislative and judicial action that has been taken to, rem to remove this discrimination. This is a very important and timely issue. The Government of Canada is considering legislation that would amend the Indian Act to remove acts, aspects of the discriminatory, discriminatory status regime. And Parliament is actually under a court order to amend the status regime. And, um, and Canada had uh, until July 3, 2017 to amend Section 6 of the Indian Act. Um, and more recently, the Court of Appeal uh, of Quebec granted another uh, extension uh, for the government to look at this. Uh, on Monday, July 3rd, they, they gave that extension uh, to keep the Indian registration process going until August 9th when the matter uh, comes back to the court. Um, so that gives you a little bit of context uh, about the discussion that we'll be having today. Um, so Fafia and Canadian Women's Foundation are thrilled to have uh, Lynn Gale and Mary Eberts present uh, with us for today's webinar. These women are trailblazing Indigenous and allied leaders who have adamantly pursued the recognition and protection of Indigenous women's equality within Indigenous communities and Canada. And they have been key expert witnesses and advocates on the issue of sex discrimination in the Indian Act's uh, status provisions. So before um, we launch uh, into the discussions, I'd like to first invite Lynn um, to say hello and introduce herself uh, to all of you. Lynn? Uh, thank you, Karen. Thank you. So my name is Lynn, as you know, and I'm an Algonquin from the Ottawa River Valley, and presently I reside in Ontario. I have a PhD in Indigenous Studies, and um, I'm the plaintiff. I was, I am the plaintiff in Lynn Gale versus um, the Crown. Thank you very much, Lynn. And uh, Mary, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks. Uh, I'm a lawyer, and I've had the honor to work for the past 25 years or so with the Native Women's Association of Canada. I have also worked in litigation with many of the women who championed the Indian Rights for Indian Women movement, including Sharon McIver and Lynn Gale, uh, whose case I uh, helped uh, take in the Ontario Court of Appeal uh, just uh, last year. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, so I'm just going to move us forward to slide number three um, so that you can 
see uh, an overview of uh, what we'll be speaking about today. Um, we'll be talking about the history of patrilineal versus matrilineal Indian status. Um, we'll speak about Bill S3, uh, which is uh, entitled an act to, end, uh, to amend the Indian Act, elimination of sex-based inequalities in registration. Um, We'll be hearing uh, some details about uh, Lynn Gale's case, uh, Gale versus the Attorney General of Canada, um, and the issues around unstated and unknown paternity um, that emerge from that. And we'll also take a moment to update you on the status of Bill S3 um, and talk about the federal government's approach uh, and the Senate's approach uh, on this issue. So moving ahead to slide four, uh, I'll invite Lara to to uh, begin. Thank you, Karen. So uh, in this webinar, we are dealing here with the concept of Indian as it exists in Canadian law and not in Indigenous laws. Uh, so this understanding or concept of Indian has been imposed upon Indigenous peoples and their own understandings of identity and community membership. And it's been imposed upon them by principally by the federal crown and then also by provincial uh, crowns. So the Indian status provisions, they are complex, they're sensitive, they have changed again and again over the decades. If you don't understand them, that is completely okay. Most people in Canada don't. Uh, and it seems to be that they get more complicated in time. Uh, and, and this is not ultimately what we want to do. We want to, be, we want to create a scheme in which people understand. So ultimately we approach this subject matter with respect and, gra and gratitude uh, to the Indigenous peoples and the Indigenous women and allies who have worked so hard year on year to advance the equality of Indigenous women and girls and their descendants within Canada's federal system and laws. This webinar uh, will specifically be focusing on the process of gaining and transmission of Indian status regarding situations of unknown and unstated paternity. Uh, so for those who are interested as well um, in the issue of sex discrimination in the Indian Act more generally, uh, we did uh, facilitate a webinar in May that also speaks to this issue. So you can be sure to check out the main webinar as well after this webinar concludes. Okay, and to provide some background content uh, before Mary and Lynn begin, uh, the Indian Act was passed, um, first passed in 1876 uh, to consolidate colonial laws, right, governing the relationship that at that time had already existed for many years uh, between the Crown and Indigenous peoples and nations. Uh, and this law was particular uh, to, to the group of Indigenous peoples that today we call First Nations, and it was to create a legal structure um, ultimately to extinguish Indigenous peoples' way of uh, functioning um, and existing in their own societies. Um, and here's a quote by Sir John A. MacDonald, which really speaks to the, the objective um, of the Indian Act. And this is an objective that arguably continues today. Okay. So in the Indian Act, it defines exactly who is an Indian, uh, quote unquote. Uh, an Indian status is a formal recognition, so by the federal government, so by the federal crown, uh, that an individual is officially an Indian within the meaning of the Act. So this designation of Indian really exists only within the meaning of the Act. Uh, it's a legal racial designation. Uh, it's the only kind of racial de designation of this sort that we have in Canada. And it's really critical to accessing treaty rights, resources, culture, and community. Um, so accessing status really matters and is very important to a lot of uh, First Nations people in Canada. Uh, and ultimately, beginning in 1876, uh, the term Indian ultimately meant a, a male person. It was a male person of Indian blood, reputed to belong to a particular band, a band um, being a label that the federal crown government imposed upon Indigenous nations. Um, secondly, it would be any child of such a male person. And then thirdly, any woman who is or was lawfully married to such person. So within this definition, you can see Indigenous women or First Nations women in their own right were not considered quote unquote Indian. Great, so moving to slide seven, um, we'll turn things over to Lynn. 
So thank you. This slide is about Indigenous Indian men and um, the right they have of gaining status and transmitting status. So status provisions in the Indian Act privileged men, Indigenous men, in two main ways. And men could pass on status to their wives and keep all the rights and entitlements to status. And um, for the most part, Indian status is only passed to children through the male line. Uh, status Indian men could voluntarily give up status in a process called enfranchisement and this meant that their wives and children were also enfranchised, but Indian women did not have this right. In this slide, we're talking about women, the rights they had in gaining and transmitting status. For Indian, um, for Indigenous women to qualify as an Indian, she had to be married to a man who had Indian status or um, she had to be the child of a man with Indian status. If an Indian woman with status married a non-Indian man or a non-status non man, she lost her status and this was referred to as the marrying out rule. Um, so this prevented women from transmitting status to their descendants and it prevented them from living in First Nation communities and participating in activities um, re regulated by, by the Indian Act. So this is a slide, um, this uh, is a letter from my great grandmother Annie Gagne. She, in 1945, she was, um, I guess, confused about her identity and she wanted to know if she was counted as an Indian. And she wrote a letter to uh, Indian Affairs and the response was that, um, in the bottom line there, it says, at the time of your marriage to Joseph Gagne, a white man, any rights you had as an Indian of the Golden Lake Band ceased and you became a white woman. So this is a letter from uh, Indian agent H.P. Ruddy. What I think is important about this letter is to understand that Joseph Gagne was actually indigenous through his mother and French through his father. So he actually wasn't a white man. So um, this slide here, I think it's slide nine, I'm not quite sure. Uh, in, uh, it, in 1985, the Indian Act was amended in, um, through Bill C-31 and it was amended to resolve the sex discrimination where Indigenous men, women lost status when they married um, non-Indian men. And it was to, intended to bring it in line with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And at that time, that's when they created the two-tier uh, registration a process of 6-1 and 6-2. And also within 6-1, uh, while Indigenous men and their descendants were all given 6-1A status, Indigenous women were given 6-1C status and their children 6-2 and their grandchildren were not entitled. So in this process of eliminating, so-called eliminating the sex discrimination, what ended up happening was new forms of sex discrimination were uh, created or passed on to the descendants of Indian women. Moving to slide 11. Uh, so this here is a, this, a lot of people have struggles with understanding 61A and 61C, so it's, it's useful to hear that knowledge over again. And so 61A status was applied to Indigenous Indian men in 1985 and all their descendants born before 85, whereas Indigenous women who were, who were reinstated were granted 61C status. And then the second generation cutoff rule was applied to the descendants of women. So the second generation cutoff rule was invented in 1985 and that's what, ha what happens is after two generations of marrying um, an Indian, uh, marrying a non-Indian person, the uh, descendants are bumped down and bumped out of status. So that goes from 6-1 to 6-2 to non-status. And uh, now the second generation cutoff rule applies to descendants of men as well, but only after 1985. So the, the um, residual uh, sex discrimination that women are calling an end for is the retroactive or the backward application of the second generation cutoff rule to women and their descendants. And that, that's what the call, the call for 61A all the way is about um, giving 61A status to the women who are reinstated and their descendants born before 85, the same way as it is applied to their Indian brothers.
Okay, so we're moving to slide 12 uh, for Mary. The uh, only exception to the basic rule that you had to derive status from your father was a little anomaly in the legislation that existed until 1985. It had different forms and different periods, but let's take the form that prevailed from 1951 to 1985. And that is that uh, the, um, a woman who had a child out of wedlock could give her child status. That was the only situation in which a woman could confer status on a child unless uh, someone came forward and actually proved that the father was not an Indian. Uh, so if somebody uh, in the community knew who the father was and knew that he wasn't an Indian and wanted to make an issue of it, they could come forward and they had a year to do that. But if nobody came forward, then the matter was settled. The child was an Indian and would be an Indian, you know, forever. So that has been called a presumption of Indian paternity. So when the father is unknown or not identified, up until 1985, the woman could give status and the, there was a presumption of Indian paternity. So what happened in 1985 was a series of changes to the Indian Act. First of all, instead of just allowing there to be one Indian parent, whether it be the father or the mother who could give status, the um, government decided that they would require two Indian parents for the child to have full status. If there weren't two Indian parents, then the child would have status under 6-2, subsection 6-2, which is called the second generation cutoff. So if you had um, a child uh, out of wedlock and you were a, a woman, you would not be able anymore to give that child status. And what happened is that the government then put in place a very, very tough policy about proving that the father of the child was a status Indian. So the dad who came to register a child had to prove that he and the mother were status Indians, but it was pretty easy to find the mother, and pretty easy then to tell whether she was status or not. But the woman who came forward to register a child had to identify the father in particular and also establish that he was a status Indian. So if the child resulted from incest or rape or any of those kinds of circumstances where it would have been very tough or impossible to identify the father, the woman was out of luck and her child was given 6-2 status. If she herself was registered under 6-2, her child got no status. And that whole thing was called the proof of paternity policy. There was no authorization for it in the Act. It was just something that Indian Affairs invented to make things difficult uh, for Indian women. Okay, moving to slide 13, Lynn. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mary. So in 1985, the Indian Act became suspiciously silent on the issue of children of unstated and unknown paternity, thus creating a new form of sex discrimination. As, as Mary explained previously, there were provisions that protected these children. So um, uh, then the second point, INAC's uh, subsequent proof of paternity policy uh, made the assumption that all unknown and unstated fathers were non-Indian. So uh, that's also known as the, um, the way I talk about it is as the presumption of non-Indian paternity. Um, so this again, as Mary said, results in children being denied Indian status if, if the mother is a 6-2 Indian or if the mother is a 6-1 Indian, they're, they're given 6-2 status. And this is applied to all post-1985 births, even in situations of sexual violence and rape and gang rape, incest and sexual slavery. And we know that Indigenous women are victims of, uh, of that at a higher rate, as well as Indigenous women with disabilities. So this is a real issue. 
What happened with my situation, although I was born in 1962 and my father was born in 1935, when I applied for Indian status in 1985, I made the assumption that the rules of um, our births would be applied and where you know there was protective provisions for my father who who I don't know who his father is I don't know who my grandfather is and what they did what INAC did is they used their proof of paternity policy and they applied it backwards to my father's birth and to me which resulted in me being denied Indian status because of an unknown and unstated paternity. Okay, slide 14. So then, um, what you know, I was living in Toronto, just a young girl, I was only in my 20s, and uh, I had to do the family and archival research. So my grandmother lived up, up north, and I didn't have a very strong relationship with her. And so that, that required a lot of work to getting the oral family history, and then the archival research was hard. I mean, I'm not an archivist. And uh, I do have a vision disability, so it took me almost 10 years to finally apply for status. And uh, through that effort, my great-great-grandmother, Angeline Jocko, and my great-grandmother, Annie Jane Maness, and my grandmother, Viola Gagne, were all uh, instated as 6-1 Indians, 6-1 status. But my father, though, he was only registered as 6-2 because they um, made that assumption of the unknown and unstated paternity that his father was a, a white person or a non-Indian person. So because my father was a 6-2 and they made that assumption, I was bumped out, I was denied status. Even though both of our births were before 1985, before they even had this policy. So. Um, of course, that did not make me very happy, and um, eventually I found the courage to walk into Aboriginal Legal Services of Toronto, and they filed a statement of claim with the Superior Court level, and they challenged the, the policy. They didn't challenge the Indian Act. But it was struck um, because um, I guess the the Crown made the argument that we, we couldn't approach it that way. and um, the Court of Appeal agreed with them that the, my first statement of claim was struck because we were focusing on the policy and they were of the thought that we had to make it into a constitutional slash charter argument. And they gave us leave to refile it. So in 2002, uh, a second uh, claim was filed, um, Aboriginal Legal Services filed it, and that's where we took it on as a constitutional slash uh, Section 15 charter argument ba based on sex and race and I think family status. Okay, slide 15 uh, for Mary. In uh, 2014, in the month of October, at least part of Lynn Gale's case came before Madam Justice Elizabeth Stewart of the Ontario Superior Court. What happened is that there had been a lot of procedural wrangling and document dumping and other procedural measures used by the Crown to try and delay or frustrate the case. And so it was um, suggested by Lynn's counsel that there just be one question put to the court as a question of law and if that question was resolved to, to Lynn's favor, then you know maybe they would settle the case. So this is the piece of the case that came before Madam Justice Stewart. And the Aboriginal Legal Services argued that the assumption of non-Indian paternity in Lynn's father's case was discrimination, her, her father's father's case was discrimination based on sex, race, and family status. All of those grounds are ones that can be reached by Section 15 of the Charter of Rights. The Department of Justice lawyers said to Justice Stewart, oh no, 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 this is not a case of sex discrimination or race discrimination or even a case of family status. This is just a case of unknown paternity. Uh, the matter is gender neutral because we all have fathers and therefore this problem applies to everyone. And they successfully convinced Justice Stewart that 
the issue is one of unknown paternity. The significance of that is that unknown paternity is not a ground uh, on which you can argue for a Section 15 of the Charter violation. So in her court ruling, Justice Stewart held that it, this was not sex discrimination, but rather an issue of unknown paternity. And then right at the end of her judgment, Justice Stewart, uh, who probably was reading between the lines as the evidence came in, said it was just really too bad that the registrar was so rigid about the kinds of evidence that the registrar would accept about the paternity of Lynn's father, um, Lynn's grandfather, because uh, there were all kinds of pieces of proof that Lynn put in that just wasn't a birth certificate. And so Justice Stewart, right at the end of her case, said the registrar could have been more flexible about this, but wasn't. So then we go on to the Court of Appeal. And uh, this is where I came into the case. I worked with the Aboriginal Legal Services to take the case to the Ontario Court of Appeal. And uh, we argued that Justice Stewart had made a mistake to say that the ground of discrimination alleged was unknown paternity. And we argued that there was um, sex discrimination here because the uh, Lynn's descent was through the female line of her family. And the other thing that we argued was that it was wrong for the government or for the court to apply this proof of paternity policy that was developed in 1985 to Lynn's birth and her grandfather's birth, which took place years before that and in, in the first case, uh, I think 50 years before. Uh, so uh, we, um, we, got, uh, we got that going as an appeal and then it was kind of interesting. I was counsel in another case in Quebec, the Dational case, where Madam Justice Mass had uh, ruled that certain provisions of the Indian Act were unconstitutional because they discriminate on the basis of sex. And in that case, she had heard evidence about some new rules that were introduced by the registrar after the first part of Sharon McIver's case had been determined. And even though those rules were in existence when the Gale case was going through the system, the government never ever disclosed them to us. And so we had to bring an application to get to see that uh, set of rules as well to see if it would assist in Lynn's case. So then we went forward to December of, 19, of 2016 uh, to argue the case in the Ontario Court of Appeal and we had as an intervener in that case the Women's Legal Education and Action Fund. So the appeal was heard in December of 2016 and the decision was released in April of 2017 and one of the first findings that the court made was that the evidence which the Department of Justice and the Registrar had kept secret uh, wasn't uh, relevant to Lynn's case. Uh, it was uh, determined by the court that it didn't apply and so uh, they just put that to the side. And then um, there were three judges who all decided that uh, there was something that had gone wrong in this case, but they took different views. Justice Robert Sharp, who was the president of the panel, he was the, the one who presided over the, the trial or over the hearing with one judge sitting on each side of him. And uh, he said that the proof of paternity policy had to be interpreted in light of charter values, that it uh, might be gender neutral looking because each parent has to prove the Indian status of the other. But he accepted our argument that it was a lot easier for the father to identify the status of the mother than it is for the mother to identify the status of the father. And he said that that 
was counter to charter values, especially the value of equality, and it could not be allowed to stand. He didn't actually find that the policy was unconstitutional because he said, interestingly enough, this policy is just an invention of the registrar. It's not a regulation, it's not a law, and so uh, we're just saying that the decision of the registrar was made in a way that was counter to charter values. The other two judges didn't use charter values in their decision, but they did say that the registrar should not have made this decision. They said the registrar doesn't have any discretion under the Indian Act. The registrar just has to apply what's there. And by inventing this very elaborate set of rules for proof of paternity that he applied to everybody, uh, he was uh, not acting properly and uh, correctly, and therefore the decision should be overruled. And like Justice Stewart, uh, the Court of Appeal said that the registrar should have accepted Lynn Gale's evidence about, the, uh, about her lineage, where she provided you know, affidavits and other things, and said that it was particularly uh, odious for the registrar to have applied the proof of paternity policy to a birth that had taken place 50 years before in social conditions that were quite a bit different from the ones that prevail now. Okay, moving to slide 18 with Lynn. Okay, thank you. So um, these are just some important figures and numbers that I think people will find interesting. So the Department of Justice um, spent almost three quarters of a million dollars defending the proof of paternity policy that discriminates against, uh, I'm going to say, Indigenous women, Indian women and their children of unknown and unstated paternity. But this does not include the funds that they that they used for the uh, Court of Appeal. I'm still seeking um, that information. And then moving on, so the Department of Justice had their expert witness, it was Stuart Clatworthy, and um, he provided some numbers of, of the number of births born of unknown and unstated paternity, and he determined from uh, uh, let me see. So this up to 2004, there was 46 oh, 46,000 children born of unknown and unstated paternity to 61 mothers. So a pre 1985, this is like 2,379, and post 85, it's 43,682. So that's a lot of births. And then born to 62 mothers, that meaning post, uh, oh, includes both pre and post 1985, there's 14,735 births. And those children would uh, be denied Indian status, immediately denied, and um, uh, denied their, their treaty rights, uh, such as education and the right to live on reserve. So that's, uh, now again, that only goes till 2004, so, that, you know, now we're in 2017, so we, that number is higher. Um, in uh, Aboriginal Legal Services, we had our own expert reports, uh, expert uh, witnesses rather, and one of them was Michelle Mann, and she uh, gave, um, outlined the um, rates of unknown and unstated paternity by age, and uh, women, girls under, rather girls under 15, there's a high rate of unknown and unstated paternity, that's 45%, and then that changes and gets less. Uh, women 30 to 34, it's 12% of children are born of unknown and unstated paternity. Okay, slide 19. The uh, legislation called Bill S3 is the bill that was put forward by the government to implement the changes uh, required by Madam Justice Mass's judgment in the Mass case. And as you've probably uh, seen in the media, the bill was turned back by the Senate uh, Aboriginal People's Committee and the government was told to fix it. That was in December, and then the government came back with a new bill in May, and there were hearings in the Standing Senate Committee on Aboriginal Peoples. 
those hearings took place just one month after the judgment of the Ontario Court of Appeal in Lynn Gale's case uh, took effect. And we were able to get the senators and also the government representatives to agree to two important additions to the bill. And they are shown on this slide. One of them is uh, the item that's identified as number six deals with the kind of evidence that the registrar uh, is required to have uh, in order to make a decision. And you'll recall that uh, the earlier proof of paternity policy had insisted on documents like uh, birth certificates and so on. <laughs> so what this section says is that um, the registrar shall rely on any credible evidence that is presented by the applicant uh, in support of the application or that the registrar otherwise has knowledge of and shall draw from it every reasonable inference in favor of the person in respect of whom the application is made. And this amendment puts into effect what Justice Stewart said at the end of her judgment and also what the Court of Appeals said, and that is the registrar should not be so rigid. <coughs> Excuse me. So the uh, amendment that is number seven deals with this issue of presumptions. You'll recall that in the pre-1985 situation, the presumption was that uh, the father was a status Indian. In 1985, with the enactment of Bill C-31, the Court of Appeal in Lynn Gale's case said, well, there really isn't any presumption here. And rather than rely on that statement from the Court of Appeal, we decided that we needed to get an amendment, and that amendment says that uh, if the identity of a parent, grandparent, or other ancestor of an applicant is unknown or unstated on a birth certificate, there is no presumption that this parent, grandparent, or other ancestor is not, was not, or would not have been entitled to be registered. So that we get rid of that horrible situation where if the name isn't known, they assume that it's a non-Indian. Okay, slide 20. So the current state of Bill S3 is a bit confused. The Senate passed uh, amendments to S3 that included the uh, amendments about proof and presumptions that I've just discussed, we are called the Gale Amendments. And the Senate also passed an amendment that goes by the uh, colloquial name 61A all the way. And that really says that anybody who lost or didn't ever get status before 1985 because they were claiming through the woman's line should have been put and should be put into uh, the system uh, under 61A. That is the clean state. You start as a 61A and then you go from there. So when the uh, bill left the Senate and went into the House of Commons, the House of Commons took out 61A all the way. They said, oh no, we don't want that. And of course, the Liberal majority in the House of Commons was used to bring that about. And they also changed the name of the bill. The name of the bill was, a, you know, a bill to remove sex inequities in the Indian Act. And so they just changed it to make it much more narrow. So there then was a problem. The House of Commons finished with the bill on the 21st of June. That was a Wednesday. And it went back to the Senate on the evening of June 21st. And if the, if the Senate had accepted the House of Commons changes, then the bill would have been eligible to be enacted and to come into law in the version that the government wanted. But the Senate said, let it be known through the Aboriginal People's Committee that it would not accept those amendments and that it wanted to have its own uh, 61A all the way uh, included and it wanted the title restored. 
So there was a bit of a showdown. The, uh, the House of Commons and the Senate were both due to stop sitting on Friday, June the 23rd. So there was only, you know, a couple of days in there for the government to play chicken with the Senate. So the plaintiffs in the Deschanel case went to court on the 19th of June to ask the court who had decided Deschanel, Madam Justice Mass, if she would please grant an extension to see us through to the fall so that, um, you know, the uh, Parliament could do its work and the Indian Act would not fall apart and registrations would not have to stop. So Madam Justice Mass refused that uh, extension and so everything on the night of June 21st was up in the air. What was going to happen? Was the Senate going to cave and enact the bill that the government wanted? Was the government going to cave? So the next day the leader of the government in the Senate said that he was just going to put the bill on the agenda for the Senate to consider sometime. That was his um, procedural move. And then the House of Commons and the Senate both adjourned until September. So that's where it sits. The bill, as mangled by the House of Commons, is back before the Senate, and the Senate can amend it again to restore what it wanted, or it can do something else with it. And that's what we're waiting to see uh, when the Senate and the House of Commons come back in September. Great. Okay, so slide 21, Lynn. Oh, great. So this is, um, so I've been following the process for a long time, since in 1985 when I was 22 years old. So I've captured some images. So in the top left, there's Sharon MacGyver and myself. Um, and that was, I think, during a 2010 protest, March of Moon. And then the, the top right is Sharon MacGyver with Gwen Brodsky and Sheila Day, um, otherwise known as the MacGyver clan. And in, in the middle, in the middle uh, sl picture, um, that is Sharon MacGyver, Jeanette Corby Laval, who first took it to court in 1973 and lost, Senator Sandra Lovelace, who went all the way to the United Nations, and then that's me um, with them. So it was really nice to have that image because we have all taken the process to court. And then the bottom image, I like to refer to them as um, the Indigenous Famous Five, and so it starts with Mary Two Acts Early, Jeanette Corbier Laval, Sandra ben, uh, Bernard, who, who you know, we don't really see much of Sandra, so I was really happy to get that photo of her. And then Senator Sandra Lovelace and Chair MacGyver. So again, I like to refer to them as the Indigenous Famous Five. <laughs> Great. Okay. And uh, we'll just move on to slide number 22, uh, Laura. Thank you. Um, so as, as Mary noted, you know, Bill S3 isn't passed yet. Uh, it, it's going to be considered again in the Senate. And so there is continued opportunity uh, to advocate and to call your senator and uh, to say that you support the Senate, um, you know, adding the 61A all the way amendment back into Bill S3 after it's been stripped. Um, of this amendment by the House. So um, so we, we would urge you, you know, to advocate um, as you would like, but know the opportunity still exists um, and that we rely on advocacy, you know, from coast to coast to coast and would appreciate the effort. Um, also, Lynn has an ongoing petition that you can access at www.lyngale.com. So please go there and consider signing the petition. And then, of course, there's social media. So, you know, unfortunately, a lot of folks don't understand these issues. Uh, there are many who don't even realize that the Parliament has been considering these important amendments to the status provisions of the Indian Act for months now. Uh, and we really do want to get the word out. So, so please feel free to share information far and wide on Twitter, Facebook, other social media platforms. Uh, you know, all action is really greatly appreciated.
Okay, Laura, did you want to describe uh, what you have here on slide 23 as well? <laughs> sure, yeah, why not? Um, I suppose this actually was a similar slide, or it's the same slide that was uh, included in the May webinar. And uh, one of the reasons why I put this slide together is really just to show how much um, sort of time, effort, um, litigation, interventions um, with the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations have occurred um, over the years trying to address the sex discrimination in the Indian Act that continues to exist today. So there are, there are many Indigenous women, Lynn Gale today being one of them, um, who have gone to court uh, in Canada, you know, all the way up, you know, well, in Lynn's case, um, to the Quebec Superior Court. Um, but uh, or pardon me, the Ontario Court of Appeal. Uh, but there, you know, those Mac uh, MacIver to the BC Court of Appeal, and then all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, and then to the Human Rights Committee. Uh, so there's been so much action. So this is just a quick overview of the different decisions that have been made um, regarding the issue of sex discrimination in the Indian Act, litigation in Canada, international human rights interventions in the Human Rights Committee, and then also the legislative amendments over time. So Bill C-31 in 1985, Bill C-3 in 2010, and then of course Bill S-3 is pending now in 2017. Great. Okay. Thank you very much uh, to Lara and thank you also to Mary and to Lynn uh, for these uh, very informative presentations. And fortunately for us, we do have uh, about 15 minutes left um, that we can uh, that we can do a Q and A with. Um, if you have questions, please do not hesitate to um, type them into the question box that you'll find on the right hand panel of your screen. And while you're thinking about that and uh, and putting in your questions, I'll get us started with uh, a couple that have been posed um, throughout our, our time together today. So the first question um, is directed, actually there's three questions um, and they're all directed to Mary uh, to start with. Um, so Mary, the first one is, why do you think that the issue of not wanting to resolve the sex discrimination um, in the Indian Act is, is crossing political party lines. Why are all of the parties seemingly in line with this idea um, that, that the sex discrimination is not so problematic? As far as uh, we know, historically, uh, oppression of Indigenous women or in Indian women under the Act has been one of the principal means that Canada has used to promote assimilation of Indigenous peoples. And assimilation of Indigenous peoples means that there aren't any official Indians left to claim the land that was um, reserved to them under the treaties or under the Indian Act. And so, you know, get rid of the Indians, as the politicians used to say, and you get all the rest of the land. And uh, we see that every time this issue comes up, people start getting concerned about, oh, how much it's going to cost and everything else. And you can see it right, goes right down to the very basic concern. It's going to be too expensive to fix gender inequality because gender inequality has historically been the way that Canada got a lot of resources out of Indigenous peoples. and it's largely a financial concern and that crosses political boundaries. Okay, thank you. And uh, a follow-up, Mary, is um, what do you think about um, the fact that Canada is seemingly getting away with this kind of discrimination, specifically against Lynn in this case, without penalty? Um, has there been discussion um, around the accountability in, in her case uh, specifically? Well, there was a claim for damages in her case, and we noted with interest, the Canadian Bar Association noted with interest that um, they now the government now has included a provision in the draft S3 to say that the government will not be liable for any decision made under the Indian Act. And so um, the claim for damages was not one of the questions or not in the package that was sent to Justice Stewart so it was just kind of sitting out there and now the government wants to pass legislation to make it clear that uh, there will be no damages owing anyone for decisions made under this act. Again, they're trying to protect their pocketbook. 
Okay, um, so this question um, could go to either Mary or to Lynn. Um, how does the cutoff date of September 1951 fit into um, this context of status discussions? I think that should go to Mary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so 1951 was an important date for the Indian Act because up until that time, decisions about who would be a status Indian were made by the local Indian agent in all the different uh, locations around Canada. And the paperwork for those decisions was supposed to be sent in duplicate to Ottawa, was kept in these big black books, but there was nobody in Ottawa kind of keeping it all straight. So in 1951, the Indian Act said, well, we're going to have a central registry in Ottawa, bring all this chaotic paperwork into some kind of order, and there's going to be a, an official called the registrar who will make all of these decisions so that the Indian agents don't uh, sort of go off in all directions. So we'll centralize this uh, feature of the Indian Act. And the government is saying in this round of discussions about S3 that, oh, well, we can't possibly have anything in this current legislation that will affect anything that happened before 1951. And they make all these allegations that there were terrible things going on and that it's going to be awfully confusing and a dreadful mess and injustice will happen if you know any legislative change at this time could possibly affect uh, the uh, situation before 1951. Well, on J June the 19th when we returned to Justice Mass to argue for an extension of this of the, of the deadline for correcting this inequality Justice Mass made it clear to us in the argument, and she took us to a portion of her decision in which she basically had said that the date of 1951 does not make a difference, that before 51 or after 51, the discrimination in the Indian Act has to be fixed. So I would say that the date of 1951 in the present debate is a great big red herring dragged across the trail by the Government of Canada. Okay, um, and I guess um, this question could be for either of you as well. Um, could you maybe just clarify for us what is the status of the McFedrin Amendment now, um, just so that we're clear about where that stands? Um, the McFedrin Amendment is 6-1-A all the way, and what happened is that when the legislation went back to the House of Commons, the McFedrin Amendment was taken out of it by a majority vote of the House of Commons. The uh, Liberals um, called on party solidarity and they got rid of that section. But the bill has gone back to the Senate and there was a um, statement issued about the same time as the bill went back by the chair and the vice chair of the Aboriginal People's Committee. and a member of the executive of the Aboriginal People's Committee in the Senate, uh, Senator Sinclair, all saying that they are content with the language of Section 61A and they want it in there and they will get it back in there uh, when they consider the bill. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we have another question here. Um, from someone who's saying it seems um, that to them as a layperson um, that the uh, language of proof of paternity is by by its own name gender biased um, <laughs> and she's saying Latin and Jewish communities also see lineage through the mother um, and she she can't see how this term can be seen as gender neutral um, and if if so why through the father is her question um, I can talk a little bit about that if Mary wants a rest. <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. <laughs> so um, the proof of paternity policy, uh, it was never made public, and I think it was largely unwritten uh, during, uh, I think it was the Court of Appeal in December of 2016. That's when uh, INAC finally said it was, it was written. It was now a written policy. So it was called proof of paternity policy, um, and of course it just 
rationally, it's it's sex. It, it's an issue of sex discrimination, in that we always know mostly we always know who the mother is. It's the father who, who we 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 you know have issues with knowing for sure who who they are. Um, why did the superior court judge think it was a gender neutral issue? I that I can't even uh, really. Uh, understand that myself other than to say that she was able to the Department of Justice with their deep deep pockets and their very skilled uh, group of lawyers were able to pull her into their paradigm when she said no this is not sex discrimination this is a known paternity and Lynn for example has brothers and and uh, they have the same situation and so that's not sex discrimination so essentially what she did there they did there is they atomized me and they're saying that I cannot experience my father's and my grandmother's sex discrimination. Um, so that's really, uh, to me, bizarre, but that's what they did. Um, the charter, uh, I, I, it's almost as if they're saying that my lawyer should have argued unknown paternity is an analogous issue under um, Section 15, but they, they did not do that. And um, Interestingly enough, the clauses that were finally added into um, the bill and have, have survived, they changed the language to unknown parentage, and, and that's okay. I, I have no problem with that um, because, uh, I don't know, I just, my, my concern was more when in the, in the Senate they started using unknown parentage. I was like, no, please stop using that. This is an issue of unknown and unsuited paternity. This is obviously a woman's issue. Don't make it gender neutral because people will miss the point. So um, to respond to the question, I cannot understand how it can be determined that it is not sex discrimination. Okay, and, and now we have, um, it's a bit of an intervention plus a question uh, from DM. Um, so DM is saying that uh, adopted people are dealing with similar issues uh, with respect to the discretion of the Register General about releasing unsealed adoption records and ignoring uh, notarized statements of paternity. And these same notarized statements uh, were deemed reliable for the purpose of legally waiving the infant's right to their uh, to their paternal relative. And now this do same document is being ignored. Um, and this is relevant to this case as there are many decisions already made that the Register General is relying on to deny adopted people access to the statement of paternity. And so DM is asking, is there a case that directly addresses this unfettered and apparently unreviewable exercise of power of the Register General? Um, is this uh, loophole something we need to take on as it goes to the heart of uh, a lot of these injustices uh, that we face? Well, let me get, get a start on that. Um, in the uh, Gale decision from the Ontario Court of Appeal, the two judges who concurred in the result, but who didn't use uh, Justice Sharp's approach of invoking equality values, just used a straightforward administrative law approach to say that what the registrar had done was incorrect. And the way they reasoned was this. They said the registrar is an official who has no discretion under this section of the Indian Act. The registrar must do what the Indian Act tells the registrar to do and therefore the standard of review that we use to um, look at the registrar's behavior is a standard of correctness. We're not going to say the registrar has discretion and therefore anything the registrar does that's reasonable is okay. So I think that you might be interested in looking at the two concurring judges in the Gale case in the Ontario Court of Appeal for their very helpful characterization of the registrar as a minor official with no discretion who has to be correct in what he or she does. Hmm. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our questions and we're just at the top of the hour, um, but I'd just like to first invite Lynn or Mary if there's any final um, things that you'd like to add before we close the session? 
Um, I would just like to say that there's also, thank you DM for the question, and there's a similar issue with um, a lot of 60 Scoop uh, children where their birth documents were tampered with by hospital administrators and government officials. And um, I think that the Gale decision will address that issue um, as well. That's, that's it. And thank you so much, Lauren, Karen, and Mary. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so thank you so much uh, also from me uh, to, to the three of you, Lara, Lynn, and Mary, um, for uh, your engaging and informative uh, presentations today, and to Lynn especially for, uh, for sharing your experience with us. Um, I think that um, this is an issue that is very clearly of interest to quite a lot of people um, and that it's it's complicated and and difficult to sift through so we really appreciate you taking the time to to do this session today um, and thank you to everybody uh, who was able to join us uh, on on the session uh, this afternoon we really appreciate that as well um, so just uh, as a reminder this session has been recorded and we will share it uh, with all of you um, and encourage you to share it as well with others uh, in your network works uh, who might also be interested in this. Uh, so that brings us to a close. Thank you everybody very much. Thank you, Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you.